Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. So, we were talking uh, this morning and last week uh, about knowing God. You know, we all have acquaintances, somebody you met oh, two years ago. That was the last time probably you meet them. And maybe you see them down the, walking down the sidewalk and you say, hi, that's an acquaintance. You probably, you know, you don't have coffee with them. You don't know them. You met them by someone else and we have an acquaintance. Well, you could hardly call that a friendship, could you? If they died, you probably wouldn't know it, and you probably wouldn't cry over it. Now, these are kind of people that, that you meet every day. If you go out of town, you, you're waiting at the grocery counter, and you wait, and you start talking to someone, and you never see him again. And then you have what I call partial friends. Well, you see him once in a while. You play cards with him, whatever you do. You see him at a social. You see him at a St. Anthony's celebration or whoever he is. I don't recommend St. Bartholomew, although I like St. Bartholomew, but he's the one that scared me to death when I was a kid. <laughs> because in my uh, parish, my good Italian parish, I don't know how they got so attached to St. Bartholomew, but they used to enact his martyrdom every year. And he was way out in the field, and I didn't want to go ever. My mother would drag me there, and she'd say, You're, he's going to bless you. And I would say, I don't want him to bless me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I felt so sorry for him. You know, they had this man dressed in a long gown, and he got, he's running through the woods, and all of a sudden they catch him. And, and I kept saying, run! <laughs> I remember one time, one time saying, run, you dubby! <laughs> well, they caught him, and then would come the fireworks. And they would uh, strip him of his gun. Not totally, no. They, they had some kind of gentle action, uh, the way they were acting towards him. But anyway, they stripped off his clothes, and they start pulling noodles out of him, wet noodles. Because he was martyred, you know, they split him open and just took everything out of him. Well, the Italian method was noodles. <laughs> and what else would Italian think but noodles? <laughs> and so I'd see these noodles flying out, and I was screaming and yelling, and I thought, what a terrible way to have fun. <laughs> And so I apologize to St. Bartholomew. You know, you got a big place in heaven with all those noodles coming out of you. <laughs> but I was scared. And I realized that we do have friends sometimes. We have good friends. We have dear friends, whatever. But are you and I a friend of Jesus? That's the important one, see? He will never let you down. 
He will always be forgiving and merciful and compassionate. You can't say that of any friend. So oh, I have a wonderful friend and we've been friends for 40 years. Wonderful. I think that's a big grace. Scripture says, if you have found such a one, praise God. But ordinarily, you can't say that you would tell your very heart to this one or that one. To some, it would be like putting it in a newspaper. Be all over town, half hour. Where you wouldn't talk to a friend like that. But with Jesus, you can talk to any friend. You can talk to him as the best of friends. Why? Because he loved you before you even knew him. Now, we know a lot about Jesus, don't we, huh? We know a lot about Jesus. We knew he came. We know he was born. We know he had a public life. We know he suffered terribly. And we know he died and rose. But does that know we, Jesus? I don't think it is. That's knowing about Jesus. But you and I have to know Jesus. Hmm? You and I have to know Jesus. And what does it mean to know Jesus? Well, the other day the sisters and I were reading. This book is getting so old. It's like one of these old newspapers, you know, it starts getting brown and then it starts disappearing on you. But in the 14th chapter of St. John, I read something that might make us think, do I know Jesus? It says here, do not let your heart be troubled. Hmm. Is your heart troubled? Well, what about? Well, I have a, my children are not in the church. We've had tragedy after tragedy in our family. This one is a born loser, never been successful in his life. This one has terrible pain. All the, so who knows Jesus? And yet our dear Lord looks at us with great love as only a friend can, a real friend. And, and say, don't let your hearts be troubled. And I want you to, to think of that. He's saying, don't let it. Ah, oh, no, that means you can do something about it, doesn't it, huh? He doesn't say, I'm going to help you not to let your hearts be troubled. No, he said, you don't let it trouble you. You see, I can feel for people, huh? Anybody ever come to you with a, a, a real pain in the heart, you know, or they just had an operation, and they begin to tell you all about their organs, all of them. <laughs> you get a real organ recital. <laughs> and they'll say, do you know what happened to me? I had a terrible operation. You know, they went in for my gallbladder and found I was a mess. They took out my gallbladder, they had to rearrange my stomach, and all of a sudden you see this terrible vision, you know, of this person slowly being dissected. <laughs> and what do you really want to do? Say, I heard it before. Oh, not only did you hear it before, you heard it ten times before. And what is your real feeling? Uh, well, I'm very busy. <laughs> I, I have an appointment. Well, you just made it up because you didn't have an appointment. You do not, you're not going to wait for the kidneys to come up. <laughs> Why? Because you've heard it a hundred times. But what does a friend do that an acquaintance doesn't do? They help the other not let their hearts be troubled by listening, listening. That's the hardest thing to do, 
is to listen. So our dear Lord is saying, I have to do something about that when I am in trouble. I cannot allow myself to be troubled with a, a, a heart that's not focused. That you can talk to Jesus about your trouble. Did you ever do that? Did you ever do that? Who do you talk to Jesus about? Your neighbor. Ooh, that's the wrong one to talk to. Hmm. They look at you like religion. What are you, a cup? A fanatic. See, you're all going to heaven, I hope. And why don't you want to talk about Jesus? If you're going to live with him forever and ever and ever and not a moment will ever pass, they'll never come to an end. Now, are you telling me you don't want to talk about him here? Oh, no. Don't let your heart be troubled about many things, see? And what does he do? He not only tells us, don't let it happen. But what else does he do? He says, trust in God and in me. So then most of our problems in life are from a lack of trust. Do you, you, you know what trust is? Trust means I don't know the end of this problem. And I know, though, he will take care. I'll do all, my, all I can, work as hard as I can. But I have to know that he is the one who does it. See? One day, Don Bosco was ready to retire. He did enough. And he goes to see the Holy Father. Oh, I don't know why he really went, just to say hello. I'm very tired. Of, I'm, I'm going to retire now. It was nice seeing you, Holy Father. I hope you're happy. Mm. He tells that to the Holy Father. I'm going to retire. And the Holy Father, oh, oh, by the way, before you do, I want you to build a, a, a basilica in honor of Our Lady Help of Christians, and I want it paid for when it's finished so I can consecrate it. John Bosco's there with his mouth open. He puts his hand in his pocket and he's got about equal three pennies. And he says, Your Holiness, that's all I got. Oh, that's fine. He said, three cents and the Holy Spirit will be enough. <laughs> and he walks out. So much for retiring. <laughs> But see, he didn't let his heart be troubled. He said, okay, where do we begin? And he walked all over Europe, walked. Oh, we would not have done that. How huh? We would have said, what do you mean? And, you know, I can't do this. I, it's not time. There's nobody giving. I don't have a horse. I don't have, there are no cars. Nothing. I have to walk from city to city. He didn't say any of that. He just went. Why? He would not allow his heart to be troubled. And the difference is not that we're not concerned. Of course we're concerned. But trouble is different. Trouble is to worry in excess of the problem at hand. Being troubled in your heart is to concentrate on what is wrong instead of saying, Lord, I trust you. You'll help me with this. I know you will. And he does. I was looking at that church Friday. And three years ago, I wouldn't have thought about that any more than sitting on the moon. Never. And I needed to do it like a hole in the head because I didn't know anything about it. And then when we did do it, where would it be? Would anybody see it? It's in the furthest place you could find. The road is so full of dust. They're trying to, to repair it. They come a couple times a day and they pour water on it. And everybody's helping, but Who's going to find it? 
See, if you think of all the ways why you cannot trust Jesus, where are you? And you know what our dear Lord says here? He said, there are many rooms in my Father's house, many degrees of glory. And he, I think this is so sweet of our Lord to do this, to say this. He said, if it were not, I should have told you. That's why you believe, isn't it? Now, don't you feel bad because you question, you doubt? <laughs> you, we can't doubt God. He said, if it was not true that there are many mansions in my father, I, I would have told you. What humility our Lord has, huh? He, he didn't have to do that. He, he could have said, look, I'm God, believe it, or I'll just conk you on the head or something. That's what I would have said. I said, you guys got nerve. No, he was so humble. He said, well, if it weren't true, I wouldn't have told you. Do you say that every time you have a question in faith? Do you really believe what Jesus says right here? We're not going to all have the same answer. I remember one time we were discussing what would, I said to the churches one day, what do you think you're going to look like in heaven? Oh, some of them had absolutely magnificent ideas. I'm sitting there thinking, God, I never thought of that. <laughs> I mean, all of my sisters had awesome ideas. I didn't think of one of them. You know, it would never dawn on me I was going to wear this or that. or. You know, I, and so I got desperate because then my turn came. I didn't know what to say. I could have said I'd like to ride a horse. They wouldn't have known. They wouldn't have cared. And so in desperation, I said, well, um, it was a mistake, though. I said, what do you think I'll wear in heaven? And they all said with one voice, as if they practiced, armor. <laughs> I didn't want to go around like Joan of Arc. <laughs> of course, after I thought about it, it wasn't too bad. But see, we all have ideas. And I dear Lord thinks it's okay. He said, there are many, many mansions in my father's house. What a, what a wonderful, why don't you try thinking of that when you wake up tomorrow morning? Instead of saying, Another day. <laughs> you kind of fall down the steps and your husband's getting ready for work. You look at him and say, well, what do you want? <laughs> and he says, bake it at eight. <laughs> and you say, make it yourself. <laughs> now, what do you want? Orange juice. We don't have any. <laughs> Why not? Because you drank it at 2 o'clock this morning. <laughs> and you slammed the refrigerator door, and I woke up. <laughs> what a morning, huh? <laughs> mm. Boy, I, I don't know what I had. I'd go down to the next street and buy some orange juice. But see, we. We get so trouble. We go to bed with it, we wake up with it. Did you ever remember as bad as things are sometimes? <sighs> that in my father's house, there are many mansions. And then he said, I go to prepare a place for you. Did you ever think of that? What an awesome thing that the Almighty Lord is preparing a place for me and you. How would you feel if the Queen of England sent you a special delivery letter and said, I'm preparing a tremendous mansion just for you? Well, you drop dead from shock. <laughs> 
But the Lord God from all eternity has decided to build me a mansion. Wow. To build you a mansion. Wouldn't that be better than falling down the steps? Or telling your husband to make his own breakfast? See, if we don't think of these little things in here, then our lives become entangled in a sense of hopelessness. Mm. And then he said, after I have gone and prepared a place for you, I shall return to take you with me. That happened when my grandfather died. My grandfather was paralyzed and he'd been a long time. And my mother was in his room changing her pillowcases. And she, you know how she, I don't know how you do it, but she put the pillowcase in her mouth and hang on to it with her teeth. Y'all do that? No, you have new kind of pillowcases today. Anyway, and, and she was pulling the pillowcase up and all of a sudden she saw two people walk in the room. And they looked at my grandfather, now he's paralyzed. And one of them said, Anthony. Anthony. And my grandfather sat up in bed. He sat up in bed. My mother's teeth were shaken by that time. And my grandfather looked at him, whoever they were, and said, no. And down he went. And then the other one said, Anthony, Anthony. And he got up the second time. And this is a man that's paralyzed. And he looked and he smiled and he said, yes. And he died. He died. And I, I thought of this the other day when we were talking about it, that the Lord said, I will come for you. Why? So that where I am, you may be with me. That's unbelievable. We're not too hot, any of us. <laughs> we got a long way to go. I don't think you're supposed to drink out of this side. <laughs> you want some on you? <laughs> Whoever put this here, the mustache part goes on this side. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we go from the sublime to the ridiculous. <laughs> but see, see, some of you have such a little opinion of yourself, you don't love yourself. It's a commandment. You have to love yourself, you miserable thing. <laughs> but that's what you think about yourself. I'm a miserable being. No, you're not. If you're in grave with sin, you are a miserable human being. But God didn't make it that way. If you were to get up in the morning, okay, give yourself a couple minutes. And you said, I'm not going to let my heart be troubled today. The Father has prepared a mansion for me. And, and the Lord doesn't want me troubled. I'm going to trust Him. Because the Lord of Lords is preparing a mansion for me. D don't you think, even though your big troubles may not suddenly go, don't you think you've lifted up a little bit? Huh? And it's not imagination, it's the scriptures. He promised that when my time comes, he will come for me. Personally, I, I hope he comes for me as a child. I've been pushing him. 
I tell everybody, if you want something, no matter how hard it is, pray to him. He's such a little one, a little one. I hope that when I die, he'll come running and look at me and say, oh, let's go. I have prepared a place for you. Wow. See, if, if you thought of that, but why? I want you to be with me. Has anybody ever said that to you? Well, <laughs> that reminds me of an old Italian lady. <laughs> <laughs> whose daughter had a one miserable life with her husband, but most of all with her in-laws. <laughs> and <laughs> their mother comes to me and she says, oh, mamma mia. I say, what's the matter? My daughter, she suffers so much from her in-laws. Oh, right, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> I said, what's the matter? What's the matter? God, they don't love me. I said, yeah, he does. No, no, no. My poor daughter has no rest. Her mean mother-in-law, she died. I says, well, isn't she happier over that? She said, no, she's not happy over that. Um, her mother-in-law go down the first. I meant she was buried first. Then my poor daughter, she died the next day, and she on top of her mother-in-law. <laughs> I said, boy, there's... You know, you can't win in that case. <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sorry, you know. I said, oh, you insulted me more sorry. <laughs> I said, well, why? Why, oh, my poor daughter, she suffer even in heaven. <laughs> I said, she does? Yeah, because of her, me and her father-in-law die and they have on top of her. <laughs> By that time, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> but she, she wasn't finished yet. I apparently did not exhibit much sympathy because I could hardly hold myself from laughing, see? And she looks at me and she says, if you know, I understand. I said, well, I'm sorry, I guess I don't. They make my daughter a sandwich. <laughs> which in English means sandwich. <laughs> but you know, this, <laughs> this woman had a problem. <laughs> and she was not about to think of the kingdom or the Lord running, going up there and making a mansion for her. And, and these are real events that cause unbelievable heartache. But wouldn't it be better though, if she could have thought, my daughter suffers so much, justly or unjustly, whatever, but now she has seen God. She has seen God. And now all her suffering has been rewarded because the Lord said, I will take you with me. So that I may be with you and you may be with me. See, we can have a pretty miserable situation, but we cannot take it to heart. And then, despair. Okay. Why? <coughs> <coughs> well, for the simple reason that he told us not to. Hmm. Our dear Lord knows us through and through. 
You can't hide from him. You can't do anything. He's there. And he sees you, he knows you, but most of all, he loves you. And if you don't understand, don't worry about it. But here comes St. Thomas, poor St. Thomas. He never caught on to anything till after Pentecost. <laughs> never. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we don't know? Can you imagine after this most beautiful discourse, beautiful discourse, one of the apostles gets up and says, how do I know where you're going? Why don't you tell me? He just did. Why don't you listen? Well, our Lord is ever patient. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you know my Father. From this moment, you know him and have seen him. Oh, here comes Philip now, another one. Hmm. I would have been so mad by this time. <laughs> I had thrown something at him, anything. <laughs> but not Jesus. He's ever patient. So Philip comes along and he says, Lord, let me see the Father and we'll, we'll be satisfied. You know, if you got to go, you go. And we'll make it. Can you imagine that? Terrible. And our dear Lord said, have I been with you so long and you do not know me? Can Jesus say that to you and me? Is everything in the world and all your problems and all your illnesses and all of us together do this all the time? Have we not known him all our lives, most of us? Have we not known he's all there, always there, the Eucharist body, blood, soul, and divinity? Have we not gone to Mass over and over and over and received him in Holy Communion? Why is it we don't know him? Have I been with you so long and still you do not know me? Well, he explains everything to Phyllis and to Thomas. If you'd like to read 14th chapter of John first to the night, this is simple, simple, not much to read. First, do I know Jesus? Do I know his love, his goodness, his compassion? Yeah, we all know that. Do I know he's preparing a place for me? He doesn't want me to worry, he wants me to trust. That time our dear Lord was in the boat, he was sleeping. And they were afraid, scared to death. And I could imagine uh, Peter saying to John, wake him up. And John said, no. This is my rendition of scripture, so don't look for it anyway. <laughs> And Philip would have come and said, he shouldn't be sleeping while we're drowning. <laughs> and Peter would say, oh, shut up. <laughs> I'm not gonna wake him. How about you, John? I'm not gonna wake him either. Here comes this big wake. <laughs> Peter's getting a little scared now. I mean, you know, that is a wave. It's filling the boat with water. They, they take everything they got and they start bucketing out the water. And John Peter said, I think you better wake him. John said, no. We're drowning, you dummy. <laughs> I'm not going to wake him. Don't you care? Yeah, I care, but I'm not going to. He's tired. Okay, we'll all go down together and he's tired. That's what I said. I'm not going to wake him. Now they're... Peter's had it. He's soaking wet, and this is the end. Okay, I'll do it myself. Master, don't you care? We're drowning. Oh. Wow. Wow. What happened now, huh? 
our Lord woke up very slow. I think he took his time. One eye at a time. of little faith. Why are you so frightened? Oh boy, the next wave would be welcome. <laughs> welcome. How is it, he said, you have no faith? Oh boy, how is it you have no faith? So he looks at them, and by that time, they feel about that big. And he looks at the wind and the waves, and he says, be still, like that. Not a breeze. Oh, wouldn't that scare you? You ever read that? Sure you have. But has it affected you? when the storm of your life comes along. Can I, our Lord say to each one of us, well done in the storm. Thank you for trusting me. Or will he say to us, oh, ye of little faith, how is it you doubt? Ah, well. We've all been in that boat that we can never say he failed us. So now we have a call. Hello? Hi. Hello. Where are you from? Uh, Pennsylvania. Good. And what is your question? I have a very troubled heart, as you're speaking about. Mm hmm And it is about my wife that I found out a few months ago was having a relationship. We've been married for like over 20 years. And I'm white. And this man is black. And I don't know how to deal with it. Well, that's a hard one, isn't it? I think you need to pray a lot. You do not need to go over it and over and over and over. You need to go before the Blessed Sacrament because you need big healing. And your wife needs repentance. And the other one needs repentance too. See, if we don't know we have offended the good God, right now, You're so hurt, you're angry. Um, you have to have pity and compassion. I don't think race is the issue. The issue is unfaithfulness, unfaithfulness. And that's a grievous offense against the commandment. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Well, I know you have failed in your life, and we all fail in, in something. So that's why you need to go to your church and sit there and pray. Say, Lord, I find it very hard to forgive. And maybe you'll hear Jesus say, yes. Yeah, I know. I have to forgive. And maybe you say, Jesus is terribly unfair. I've been faithful all my life. And he'd say, yes, I know. I was faithful all my life. And then maybe he would say, you 
have to forgive. And then you would say, I can't. I won't. Hmm. I think our Lord then would say to you, have I died for you in vain? Are you one that will walk away? Well, you see, you need to ask yourself some question. I must forgive. I would try to see if maybe your wife needs some help. That would be something you should do. Help her. Help her. And just ask the Lord, ask Our Lady to help you to forgive. Why? Because you need to forgive in order to be forgiven. <laughs> and your wife needs to know she needs to repent, and that's a grace from God, see? We're going to pray for you. I know it's hard. And I hope my few words will help you to forgive and give God the joy of forgiving an unjust heartache. And maybe if you do, our dear Lord himself will give her grace to be faithful. And it's everywhere. You look at a newspaper, a magazine, the television. The whole story, no matter where you go, is unfaithful, unfaithful, unfaithful. Well, it has to stop somewhere. Let it stop with you. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Hi. Where are you from? Mother Angelica? Yes. Oh, I didn't know. I, God bless you and your ministry. Thank you. I want to ask you, Mother. Well, let me turn this down. In heaven, will we have a free will the same as we have on earth? Huh? I hope not. <laughs> I tell you why I hope not. I hope you hope not. When you die, your will is set, finito, boom. A big door closed, not literally. Your will is set. You cannot will anymore because your entire heaven, your degree of glory, that mansion we got through talking about, is ready from what you sent up, not what you're going to send up. The amount of love you have for God at death. You know, God isn't like Social Security, say, where you get your 10 best years. <laughs> That's not how it goes. My floor manager here is giving me signals. <laughs> it's his duty, they tell me, so it's okay. <laughs> but, you see, and, and whatever I've gone through and done for the Lord is right there, and the opportunity to change is gone. Now we say, oh, that's terrible. No, oh, hey, we got purgatory. It's a wonderful place. <laughs> Better go on the other way. <laughs> that's that second chance. I don't know why all of you or some of you get so excited. What would we do without purgatory? We'd have to go some other place. None of us seem to be ready. But see, your, your memory, your understanding, your will, though, has ended. See, you, you're never going to be up there and say, hey, Lord, I don't like this thing over here. You know, can't you change it? Well, why'd you bring that nut in here? <laughs> I wasn't pointing at anybody here. I just had to point somewhere. Lord, this 
man was so unjust to me and so unfair to me and he lied to me and he cheated me and you got him up here? <laughs> now, wouldn't we say that if I had a will? Oh, hey, well, we'd never made it. <sighs> what we have then, my friend, oh, it'll be beautiful no matter what we put up there or sent up there. But still, you can't change it. It's sealed. Well, I don't want to cause you any scruple. That's not good. But we have to know, huh? When I come to the end of the road and the Lord stands there and looks at me and says, Angelica, come. That's what I got. He won't say to me, oh, you did a good job. You built stations and churches and monasteries. No. He won't say any of that. I know he won't. Because the only thing important to him about it is how much did I love him while I did it? Did I give him all the credit? Did I love him with my whole heart? Did I want no honor but his glory? That's what's going to count. Because I can't make a decision anymore. My decision making is finished. And some of you listening to me tonight, maybe you don't want to listen, but you're stuck there <laughs> for some reason. But you need to go to confession, like tomorrow or tonight if you can because we know not the time, nor do we know the hour when he will look and say your name and say, come. Whatever we got at that point is it. We have another call. Hello? Hi, Mother. Hello. Uh, this is Ellen. Uh -huh. um, you made my night, my, my uh, year by getting through. Um, I want a little preface here that recently I've gone through a great deal of torment and yeah. my son I discovered went from alcoholism to heroin. Um, I have been financially depleted and emotionally and every other thing and I thought my heart was closed. But one of the benefits of this is that I it was like I had Jesus on my kitchen table having coffee. I cried and I poured out my heart and soul. The closeness I have gotten through his mother and him is unreal. Praise God. The other thing is I received an answer to my finances. I didn't get extra, but I got what I needed. Good. But here's my question. First of all, I want to say one of the benefits is, is besides me getting that relationship with our Lord, is I've broadened my prayers not only to my son, but anybody who abuses alcohol. I've learned to... You know, we're not the only ones in this world with this problem. Right. Um, I have St. Michael working on double duty, I think, with him. But one of the problems I have is once on your show you mentioned that Jesus knows everything. We should not have to keep repeating a request. Mm. Um, sometimes, like this time, I, I had every saint, you know, I, I really pleaded with them. And for my son's um, recovery, which he just got out of a rehab and is doing well so far, but I feel kind of guilty. I have a little confusion on, am I nagging our Lord? Oh, no, I don't think so. You know, sometimes our dear Lord uh, seemingly says two different things, but he never does. One, he said, um, trust your father knows you need all these things. Feast first the kingdom of heaven and all these other things will be added. Hmm. And then he said one day, knock, 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 knock. So what does he say? Two opposite things? No. We don't have to nag. Did you ever see a nagging wife? Oh, mama. What a terrible thing, huh? 
Where were you this morning? Why are you late? Dinner's cold. Well, you're lucky you don't put it on your head. <laughs> so we don't have to nag the Lord. He's our friend. He's our friend. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's everything to us, huh? So we don't have to nag him. We can talk to him. We can once a day say, remember Johnny, you know, he's in trouble, Lord. Finish, finish. You don't have to nag him. <laughs> In a case like your son, he's getting on his feet. Say, Lord, take care of him. Make him love you. That's it. He heard you. He is not deaf. He doesn't wear a hearing aid. He heard you the first time today. What would happen is a penny lord here, and I would say to her, Penny, will you scrub this floor for me? And she said, sure, mother. And then 10 minutes later, I said, Penny, would you scrub this floor for me? She said, oh, yeah. I say, fine. But she hasn't done it yet, see? <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes later, I look, it's still dirty. Penny, will you scrub this floor for me? I'll scrub it, mother. Two hours later. Hey, Penny, yeah, are you going to scrub this floor? You know, I think she goes so tired of hearing me, she wouldn't bother. I asked her five times in three hours. That's human hope. You ever hear, it used to be an old television show when I was a kid. I forget the name of it, Jack Benny. <laughs> and he had a, a comedian with him and he'd say, hope, 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 hope. <laughs> What is that? You can more than hope in God. You pray for your son every day. Once. He wants him converted more than you do. And then the rest of the day, go on loving him, praising him. He hurt you. And he's hearing you now. <coughs> A little second for my asthma would help. So you did the right thing, and you're doing the right thing. Trust him. And I got 30 seconds left. Some of it I'm going to use to drink this stuff. <laughs> and it is water. <laughs> Please be generous. I told you that the church has been taken care of. If I need help with it, I'll ask you. In the meantime, keep this network going. It means a lot to God and to you. Bye now.